are very fortunate today that this year in Minneapolis, the Democracy Convention has been taking place at the University of Minnesota. David Swanson of World Beyond War is the convener of that group, and he has consented to be our keynote speaker today. David is a peace activist uh, nationally, and we are very pleased to welcome you to the Minneapolis Lindale Park Peace Garden on this August 6th of 2017. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Louder? Is that better? Thank you for inviting me to speak here. I'm grateful. I'm honored. There we go. But it's not an easy task. I've spoken on television. I've spoken to large crowds and important big shots. But here you are asking me to speak to hundreds of thousands of ghosts and billions of ghosts in waiting. To think about this subject wisely, we must keep all of them in mind, as well as those who tried to prevent Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and those who survived, and those who reported, and those who forced themselves to remember over and over in order to educate others. Perhaps even more difficult is thinking about those who rushed to make all those deaths and injuries happen, or who went along unquestioning, and those who do the same today. Nice people, decent people, people superficially similar to you and me, people who do not abuse their children or their pets, people perhaps like the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet who was asked last week if he would launch a nuclear attack on China if President Trump ordered him to. His response was a very principled and reasonable yes, he would obey orders. If people don't obey orders, the world falls apart. Therefore, one must obey orders, even when they rip the world apart. Even illegal orders, orders that violate the UN Charter, orders that ignore the Kellogg-Briand Pact, orders that annihilate forever all existence of or memory of every beautiful childhood memory and every child. In contrast, Jeremy Corbyn, the head of the Labour Party in the UK and the next Prime Minister, if current trends continue, has said he would never use nuclear weapons and he has been widely denounced for being so unreasonable. We can and must eliminate nuclear weapons from the face of the earth before they are intentionally or accidentally used. Some of them are thousands of times what was dropped on Hiroshima. A small number of them would create a nuclear winter that starves us out of existence. Their proliferation and normalization guarantees that our luck will run out if we do not eliminate them. Nukes have been accidentally launched in Arkansas and dropped on North Carolina. Comedian John Oliver said not to worry, that's why we have two Carolinas. <laughs> the list of near misses and misunderstandings is staggering. Steps like the new treaty advanced by most of the world's nations to ban possession of nuclear weapons must be worked for with everything we've got and followed with campaigns to divest all funding and to extend the process to include nuclear energy and depleted uranium weapons. But bringing the nuclear nations, and in particular the one we are standing in, to join the world on this will be a major hurdle. And it may be insurmountable unless we take steps not only against this worst of all weapons thus far manufactured, but also against the institution of war itself. Mikhail Gorbachev says that unless the United States scales back its aggression and military dominance with non-nuclear weapons, non-nuclear nations, other nations will not abandon the nuclear missiles that they believe protect them from attack. There is 
there's a reason that many observers view the latest sanctions on Russia, North Korea, and Iran as a prelude to war on Iran, rather than on the other two. It is the ideology of war, as well as the armaments and agencies of war, that condemns Jeremy Corbyn while applauding a man who professes blind allegiance and obedience to an illegal order. One wonders whether such good soldiers and sailors view Vasily Alexandrovich Arkhipov as a degenerate or as a hero. He was, of course, a Soviet naval officer who refused to launch nuclear weapons during the Cuban Missile Crisis, thereby quite possibly saving the world. As enjoyable as we may find all the lies and exaggeration and demonization directed at Russia by our elected and unelected officials and their media outlets, I think erecting statues of Vasily Arkhipov in U.S. parks would be much more useful, perhaps next to statues of Frank Kellogg. It's not simply the ideology of war we have to overcome, but parochialism, nationalism, racism, sexism, materialism, and the belief in our prerogative to destroy the planet, whether by radiation or by fossil fuel consumption. This is why I have misgivings about things like a march for science. I have yet to hear about a march for wisdom being planned, or a rally for humility, or a demonstration for kindness. We even had a rally for nothing, opposed to rallies organized by a comedian in Washington, D.C., prior to ever having had one demonstration for these other important causes. There's a line in a book and a movie by Carl Sagan called Contact that has the main character sagely wanting to inquire of a more technologically advanced civilization how they made it past the stage of, quote, technological adolescence without destroying themselves. But this is not technological adolescence that we are in. Technology will continue to produce yet more and more dangerous devices as time goes by. Technology will not become mature and begin producing only helpful stuff. Because technology is not a human being. This is moral adolescence we are in. We empower delinquents who urge police to crack heads and their buddies to assault women and who try to solve problems with giant walls, junior high level propaganda, denial of health care, and the frequent firing of people. Or we empower equally adolescent prom king characters like the US president who went to Hiroshima a little over a year ago and declared quite falsely that, quote, Artifacts tell us that violent conflict appeared with the very first man, end quote, and who urged us to resign ourselves to permanent war with the words, we may not be able to eliminate man's capacity to do evil, so nations and the alliances that we form must possess the means to defend ourselves, end quote. Yet a dominant militarized nation gains absolutely nothing defensive from nuclear weapons. They do not deter terrorist attacks by non-state actors in any way. They do not add an iota to the U.S. military's ability to deter nations from attacking, given the U.S. ability to destroy anything, anywhere, at any time with non-nuclear weapons. They also don't win wars, and the U.S., the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, France, and China have all lost wars against non-nuclear powers while possessing nuclear weapons. Nor, in the event of a global nuclear war, can any outrageous quantity of weaponry protect the United States in any way from apocalypse. We must work to eliminate nuclear weapons, President Barack Obama said in Prague and in Hiroshima. But he said, probably not in his lifetime. We have no choice but to prove him wrong about that timing. We need to evolve beyond what our leaders tell us about nuclear weapons, including what our schools tell our children about the justification for bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I'm skipping over some paragraphs of evidence for what I just said in uh, the name of saving time. The, the United States needs to stop lying to itself and start leading a reverse arms race. 
This will require humility, deep honesty, and openness to international inspections. But as Tad Daly has written, quote, yes, international inspections here would intrude upon our sovereignty, but detonations of atom bombs here would also intrude upon our sovereignty. <laughs> the only question is, which of those two intrusions do we find less excruciating? Thank you. <laughs>